been looking forward to this one because yours truly is trying to pick up speed with his golf swing. And the guy who's our guest today, Tyler Standiford, is an expert at that. In fact, he's got all of the secrets he's likely to share. Tyler, uh, thanks for your patience with me. Welcome to our podcast. How are you? Yeah, no, it's great to be here. And Mark, I'm willing to share all the secrets as long as my brothers don't get to listen to the podcast because I still <laughs> need my speed gains on them. Yeah, well, I lost the speed gains to my younger brother a long time ago, but that's for a different story. All right. Um, before we dive into it and share all of the gold from all of your research, uh, by the way, I've looked at some pictures online, uh, uh, your lab that you have, that lab. Mm -hmm. And we want to talk about that. But before we go there, tell us some about you, please. Yeah, so uh, I have a PhD in biomechanics. And, and honestly, it's been now probably 15 years ago, I was in my undergraduate biomechanics class, planning to be a real doctor. And <laughs> um, my professor said of biomechanics said, man, if I had any interest in the game of golf, uh, I could do some really cool things in the world of biomechanics and golf. And so I honestly approached him after class that day, Mark, and, and uh, that's what started kind of my journey to get a PhD in biomechanics. It was always with an end goal to, to do golf research. Mm -hmm. um, I've had a little bit of a, a different path there. So I, I finished my PhD in Knoxville, Tennessee, where I did a lot of research on older adults and joint replacements, All right. um, which is a big part of biomechanics, obviously. And uh, I'm a professor at Utah Valley University, which is in Orem, Utah. And um, now you kind of mentioned my lab. My lab is basically built up to do sports biomechanics. Okay. Um, so I do a lot with our athletics teams looking at kind of how athletes produce ground reaction force in jumping and landing and cutting and how I can work with their trainers to make them better, mm -hmm. less risk for injury, improve performance, you know, what every athlete's looking for. Um, and, but always again with the end goal of, I want to use these skills that I'm developing to look at golf swings. And so um yeah one more i, I want to get to one more question about uh -huh. you, how you got to golf but but first off when you use the term ground reaction force nowadays everyone's like oh their ears perk up and they're like ah, yeah this is like the gold this is the secret um talk to what i want you to talk to how many similarities there are between just any sporting or athletic movement and the golf swing, because for the longest time, it seemed like these things were separate from each other. Yeah, that, that's such a great question and a perception, uh, perceptive question too, Mark, because um, they're incredibly similar. And I think that's what I'm finding. Again, I work a lot with our soccer, volleyball, and basketball teams, both men's and women's. Um, and I think the things that are similar are one, athletes need to produce a lot of force. So what can we do to help them produce more force? Yeah. Um, I think every sport can benefit from producing that force at the right time. I think that's a key component across the board in sports, right? And in golf, imperative, right? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, the other, the other piece too is, is producing ground reaction force in the right directions. Um, <laughs> and I think this is common across all sports like like take an example uh we work with our our cross country and track and field teams so if i have a a high jumper come into my lab versus a long jumper the way they generate force is is fairly similar but the directions of those forces are entirely different and so again it, it the the principles hold true it's just a matter of looking at that sport and saying okay what are the forces that i care about the very most and how can i improve the magnitude, the timing, and the direction. No, I'm, I'm scribbling feverishly. <laughs> magnitude, timing, it, and direction. Because I want to get, I want to get back to that. And I know you've got some cool slides you're going to share with um, the folks who are viewing this thing on my website or on YouTube. But it is available by audio as well. Um, first off, I, and I was going to back up to this one. You know, you wanted to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. Now you're in biomechanics. Were you always a golfer that, that golf sort of came about? Or, or? Yeah, so my, my dad played uh, college golf for one year, and uh, I've got three brothers. So I've been playing golf since I was six or seven years old mm -hmm. um, and have been obsessed with the sport, like, like probably a lot of your listeners and, and a lot of people. And, um, and I was never good enough to, you know, I played high school golf, but that was about it. Um, I can beat all my brothers, so that's always nice. Um, but uh, again, it was, it was this piece where when I started shadowing doctors, I thought, Hey, this is kind of cool, but it's not where my passion lies. And, 
And I'm sitting in an undergraduate biomechanics class learning about ground reaction force and learning about angular velocities and rotational movements and how we can utilize math paired with the human body to improve the way humans move. And, and again, when he said that, this light bulb went on and I thought, I could make a career out of this. Um, and uh, I mean, if you had told me 12 years ago, this is what I'd be doing in the world of biomechanics, I, I probably would have laughed. Uh, this is a great place to be. Well, uh, and it's a great time too. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I work out on the PGA tour and it seems like every, you know, they're coming thick and fast now, the youngsters, and they just come out faster. And I, I wouldn't say injury resistant, but they certainly aren't prone to injury. Like, you know, golfers were a year back, years back when, you know, movement perhaps wasn't that efficient. Um, one more question before we dive into mm -hmm. your research and stuff. I'm an instructor deep down. That's my DNA, right? And uh, the object of my, me is to help the, the student to understanding so that they can shoot better scores. And yes, data has proven now that if you drive the ball or hit the ball longer, you stack the odds in your favor to shoot lower scores. That, that's the probability of it all. Mm -hmm. But then I see golfers, Tyler, where they, you talk about ground reaction forces and they misunderstand stuff. So they're like, well, I know I've got to jump, right? And the next thing I see golfers popping up and down all over the place. <laughs> and they not none of that force is transmitted to the golf ball, let me say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I want you to put this all into context before we dive into it, because my concern always is the misunderstanding of folks who say, dang, yeah, I'm going to employ more force and add more force and do this. And the next thing, they just, they're either covering the golf course with their golf shots or they're miss hitting terribly. Yeah. And, and I think you bring up a great point where, we're, we're, we are in the information age and the technology age. So everyone can hop online and watch some video of someone talking about ground reaction forces. Um, and, and I think where the importance lies is that we have individuals that, that know the correct way to talk about it. I think that's a big piece of it, not just people that think, think they know what's going on. Um, but also I think the, the measurement and the tools to increase those ground reaction forces. Okay. Um, and, and I think that's what I've really tried to center my focus around Mark is because I, I wouldn't say I've ever really been a theoretical biomechanist, meaning I'm not really interested in the most advanced equation I can put in a research paper. Uh, what I'm interested in are what are tools that I can give to an athlete, be it volleyball, basketball, or golf, something simple they can maybe do in their training, in the gym, in their practice that I've now collected the data. And I can actually look and say, hey, I know this works, not because of my fancy theoretical equation, but because I look at your ground reaction force and I know this will work. Well, folks, can you see why we've got him now on the podcast of you? Because look, theory and all that sort of stuff is great and it sounds sexy as rip. Mm -hmm. But in the final analysis, when I'm on course and I've got some guy coming down the, the, the final stretch there, lining up a PGA Tour victory, whatever the case might be. Uh, they just trying to get the ball into the hole in one yep. less than the competition. So yep. I'm jacked. All right. So tell me when you want to bring in visuals and stuff. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. I, I want to kick it off over here with your research and all the data you've driven and how it's influenced um, the super speed training protocols, because I've got those uh, super speed sticks, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call them. Mm -hmm. And I see gains out of folks, but, but, but now you've advised, if I understand correctly, how the training regimens can be changed and made more efficient. Yeah, and that's kind of been at least where I first started you know, with a background in exercise science and biomechanics. Um, I, when I looked at our training protocols, and this is true with training in general, Mark, this isn't a secret to, to golf or any sport, but consistency is going to trump everything. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then finding the right stimulus. So I think at times we can either get excited about our speed gains and say, well, I know super speed suggests three days a week, but I'm going to do five days a week right. and it's going to be even better. Mm -hmm. Or, Hey, I've done these, I've done the first level. I've trained for five, 10 weeks and I've gained this speed. Awesome. Now I'm going to go out and just play and enjoy. And that speed's never going to disappear. Um, and so where I kind of stepped in was really looking at one is the stimulus correct um, and two, you know, how can we build in these cycles? Because golfers don't want to be and probably shouldn't be going at speed hog wild 100%, uh, you know, every day or every week of the year. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and so 
if, if you've seen the updates to our to kind of our training phases, we now kind of have them split into what we call primary training phases where you're really trying to gain speed. That's where you're training for three days a week. Mm -hmm. And then we have these maintenance phases where we know from good research that one day a week of speed training will retain all of the benefits you've gained. Um, and I think there's nothing more frustrating to golfers and honestly to us too, because we want golfers to gain speed and keep speed are the golfers who gain that speed, shut everything down. And then six months later, they're like, how come I'm not hitting my driver 250 like I was before? That's so, um, that's so interesting. I'd love, I'd love to camp there for a minute because, uh, you know, I wouldn't call it the tyranny of the now, but, 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 you know, golfers are like, well, I'm swinging great and this is me. I'm going to be good. And then all of a sudden the thing falls over and, and golf to me is just, it's ebbs and flows and waves and all of this stuff. And, and, if one's just going through the aging process, like we all are, and I'm at 51 feeling it now because I don't play golf, but mobility goes. And so I love your input and your advice to the viewer slash listener going, hey, just because you have it now doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have it six months down the track. You have to nurture mm -hmm. what you have built over here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think in that component, it, like we're, we're not saying it's a lot. Um, and this is true in every physical function, right, Mark? I mean, if, if I'm a if I'm a runner, in fact, here, here's a quick little story, right? I used to be primarily a marathon runner. I've done a half Ironman. Like that's, that's where my training was. Right. And in the past year, I've really tried to gear myself towards some strength and some speed in my golf swing. And uh, my wife said, hey, why don't you come out and run with me? I said, okay. So I, I went out to run with her. I literally thought I was going to die. Um, and it used to be that I could go out and run, you know, 13 miles at six and a half minute mile pace. We went four miles and at nine minute mile pace, I mean, I was huffing and puffing. Yeah. We lose things. We all understand we lose things. And so I think, especially for our golfers that are over 40 um, and as that age goes, the first thing they're going to lose is that ability to move fast. The ability of your brain and body to activate those, those muscles that are, are, are built to fire fast. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take a lot to retain those benefits. You know, I mean, one day a week of some good mobility stuff in our warm up, um, a good set of, of really swinging with intensity and high speeds, and, and you can retain and then build benefits with a couple more days a week. You know, we, we see these gains well into people's, you know, 60s and 70s. I'm glad you say that because on this very show before we've had experts, training experts, in fact, like trainers and such, and, and they talk about the speed windows that human beings mm -hmm. have and how you can maximize these. And I certainly recognize that. But as I was releasing this podcast, I was like, you know, some 49 year old golfer, one of my contemporaries listening to this is like, so what am I past my sell by? And I'm just going to resign myself to the fact that I'm going to be decrepit and slow. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I think the reason why it, it can work for anyone, Mark, is because we're training two things. You know, one, we're training just the, that, what I described with the brain's ability to activate the correct muscles and learning new movement patterns and faster movement patterns. But the other thing too, is I do see a lot of cool technical improvements in the golf swing that now when we think of speed like a skill that you're acquiring in the golf swing, um, maybe half skill, half uh, this physical function, mm -hmm. um, to suggest that, yeah, our, our 50 year old accountant who's playing golf one or two days a week is always going to swing at 100 miles per hour. I, I just, I don't see that. I, I see the opposite where they have plenty of speed to gain. Wow, this is good news. Um, I, I want to. I'd obviously done some research on you and I, I saw bits where you were talking about the fact that speed training can influence swing mechanics as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah. this as an instructor obviously fascinated me. Now, naturally I've always found, and this was from some long conversations. Well, first me just trial and error as an instructor and a player. But then I talked with John Novasil from uh, the tempo training people um, and how, you know, swinging the club faster essentially the club will find the most efficient route back and down through the ball. Mm -hmm. So when I saw this, I was like, my interest is peaked. So that's why I wanted to talk to you about it because this is some of your research where, you know, you, add, you work on your speed training and your swing mechanics should iron themselves out a little bit. So please go there. Yeah. So I think when we look at this idea of, of efficiency in the golf swing and maybe speed as a measurement of efficiency, at least loosely, 
um, the question that we get asked a lot from golfers is, is speed training going to ruin my swing? You know, am I automatically going to, when I start swinging faster, I'm going to come out of my shoes and come over the top and, mm-hmm. and that's it, you know, all is lost. Um, and it's, it's just not what I see in my lab. Um, and so I think what tends to happen as golfers try and generate speed to swing fast, one, you have to use the ground well. Yeah. Do you have to sequence things really well? Right. Mm-hmm. I can't, I can't swing. I mean, I haven't seen a lot of really ugly, fluid, fast swings. I mean, again, we know that guy that just brute force raw power and just smacks at the ball and hacks at it. But most of those swings that are fast, will make a comment of like, they look effort. It's effortless the way they're, they're making that swing move. And so what I'm starting to see in, in some of my data, especially if I'm focusing on the kinetic sequence, and that's how a golfer utilizes the ground and the different timings of ground reaction forces. Um, I just see that improve time and time again with the golfers where they're doing the things that we know they should be doing in the golf swing and they're doing it better. Um, now, does that, well, actually, again, I, I like to tell stories with data because that's what I do, right? My, my role I, I, is super I know you've speed. graphs and you got some images you yes. want to share if you want to go I, ahead. I do. So I, I want to I tell a story and then show you a graph that I think depicts this really well. So um, I had a golfer in the other day. I was actually doing a research study with our, our counterweighted trading club. So this was the Super Speed C club. It's a one club system. And, and we've been trying to figure out exactly how it works. We, we've seen kind of good feedback. And a golfer came in for his post data collection. I was looking at some hand speed and, and some mechanics on the track man and things like that. And um, he went from an attack angle on his driver um, of negative seven. So he's coming into the ball and he's descending that ball, no. which again, you're, you're laughing at that because it's like a- every amateur golfer is probably doing that, or at least 90% of them, mm-hmm. huge distance killer. Um, these just spinny, poor shots. Um, we know the good players are going to come in flat or with some kind of positive attack angle uh, up into that. He came in for his post data collection. He went from consistently negative seven to consistently zero or positive one. Just by and working on the speed training regimen. That's all he was doing. And I asked and we talked, right? Because because I, again, as a practical person, when these golfers come in for their post data collection, the question I always start out with, Mark, is how's your golf game, right? How, how are you playing? What, what, what does it look like on the course? I, I don't care what advanced mathematical equation says your golf swing looks like. Tell me how you're playing. And this guy said, Tyler, it's awesome. I'm hitting the ball better than I ever have. My friends were asking me why I'm hitting the ball better than I ever have. And he said, I feel looser. I feel more fluid. And then I say, let's, let's look at the numbers. Mm-hmm. Let's see what actually is changing in your swing that's giving you this feeling that you're actually playing better golf. And for this guy, it was that he went from that descending blow to a positive blow. Interestingly enough, Mark, he only picked up maybe one to two miles per hour of swing speed, but he picked up 25 yards oh, of distance. Farther. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 25 yeah. yards. I mean, that's huge. I'm glad you say that because, you know, when, when people talk speed and when I've taught golfers since I forget. I started teaching in 1996. Um, people misconstrue speed and, and they talk about swinging faster. And all of a sudden you use the term brute force. It's like when Brasson DeChambeau went to the speed thing and he just got as big and heavy as he could so he could mm-hmm. swing as hard as he could. He told me this on this very show. And now after hooking up with Carl Berkshire, he's learning how to truly swing the club faster and he's working less to get more because mm-hmm. he sequence better you name it so a lot of folks think speed and then the next thing they're moving around the place like banshees and the club head speed is down and so the yep. ball's down yep or then vice versa they've got the club head speed up but they're coming in at the wrong angle or whatever the case might be and the ball speed is down so what you say there's so appropriate because you don't have to necessarily have a whole big gain in club head speed but it's what the ball ends up doing Yep. And that's where then we get to these practical things like, you know, ball speed is going to, is going to, uh, I mean, it should dominate the day. Sometimes we can't measure it and that's okay. And club speed is at least a good measurement that we know there's something taking place. But, and I always like to look at ball speed in my lab because these golfers obsess around a club speed number and trying to teach them, Hey, 
you know, I mean, this, this golfer actually said to me, he said, I'm sorry, I, I probably wasn't helpful in your study. <laughs> I said to him, well, I hey, guess what, like, I want to just see what's going on. I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, cook the data and make it look the right way. I said, but you didn't at all. Cause look at these numbers. And when I pointed it out to him, he just, again, he was, he was so excited about, about what he was doing. I think it brings up a, a, a brings up a question for me, but a, a good question to address just for the understanding of the listener. And that I've seen something to the effect, and correct me if I've got the numbers wrong, but but just across the board generically, every addition of one mile an hour worth of club head speed adds to about you know three to four yards in carry, right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So, I mean, two and a half to three are kind of the numbers that I'm seeing, but yeah, that that's about right. Three. So, so, so let's call it three yards. Mm-hmm. So if you pick up just three or four miles an hour, you're hitting one iron shorter. And yeah. then not just the one iron shorter, you're driving it that little bit further. So you got two irons shorter. So I want you to help the golfers to understand like what's acceptable swing speed gains, because sometimes we're going to this with stars now. I was thinking, well, I'm going to go from 95 to 115. And that's also yeah. possible. Yeah. And probable. <laughs> it, it's a great question, Mark, again, because um when I'm, when I'm assessing speed gains, first, I want to be really accurate about my speed gains um, as, as I'm measuring them with, with the research subjects, because I think that, like you said, the glitz and glamour is, man, this guy picked up 15 miles per hour. Well, what if I didn't do the same warm up? And what if one day I collected someone's data at night versus fresh in the morning? And what, you know, there's so many different ways. And honestly, Mark, like I could, I can manipulate the situation in the data collection and help them increase speed. That that's not hard to do. I, I know what makes the club go faster. I'm so glad you said that. And I'm cutting over you. Forgive me. No, you're fine. But I get into knockdown drag outs on, on, on another podcast that I'm on with guys that just take a strokes gain metric and they can massage any statistic to fit their argument. I, so I'm mm-hmm. so glad you addressed that. Yeah. And, and that's, what's unfortunate. And I think you see that a little bit where Again, when I'm working with a professional player or an amateur player, it's like, hey, we're going to establish a baseline and we're going to be so consistent every single time. We're not going to swing with more or less intensity pre to post. We're not going to do a different warm up pre to post. Um, You know, I know if I were to look at their speeds after they swing the super speed clubs for five minutes, their their speeds are going to go up. So, you know, I think we need to accurately assess that. And then I think the other piece of that too, Mark, is, is communicating to golfers. So again, for example, in a simple way, you know, like the first hole at the course I play a lot at is a, like a 400 yard par four, pretty straightforward. And before I started speed training, my max driver is probably in the 250. If I really hit one rail 260 and I'm in Utah, so I'm at, I'm at really high elevations. Yeah. And now that I've done speed training for a year, I'm now up to like 275, 280 with my driver. So I picked up maybe 15 to 20 yards. And, and so maybe that equates to four or five miles per hour is all with my driver swing. But now what's happening, Mark, is on number one, it used to be I hit a driver and I'm maybe 150 out. And my 150 club, because of my swing speed, is an eight iron. Yeah, okay. Well, the other day I played there, I hit what I thought was a fine drive. I think it went 275 on that hole. And now I have 125 instead of 150. Well, guess what club I now hit 125? It's either like a knockdown pitching wedge or just like a full on gap wedge. I went from eight iron to half pitching wedge. And all I did was picked up maybe four miles per hour of swing speed. So you, you, you've got folks, viewers and listeners going, all right, I think I need to get this, the, the super speed clubs. Um, we'll talk about that a bit more, but when I had Mike Napoleon on the show, I believe it was, we talked a lot about something I learned from Gary player when I was like knee high. All right. And Mr. Player, you know, we didn't, he didn't have the benefit of launch monitors and stuff. He just would swing in two directions, right-handed and left-handed. Oh, uh-huh. And he preached this to all young South Africans. He goes, otherwise you'll just develop your body in one way. You've got to swing in both directions. Nowadays it's called non-dominant training and it's yeah. a thing. So I want you to talk about that, please. Yeah, I've, you brought this up, um, Mark. And so I feel like I've, I've got to, I've got to share something. Um, cause I think there's something I have on here that would be really interesting to the, the user. So if, if I may real fast, because we do have folks listening on audio only, yep. folks, if you want to see these graphics, I'll do my best to describe, but if you want to see the graphics, go to markimulman.com, just search the podcast with Tyler, or of course it's on YouTube. All right. Off yep. you go. 
And I'm happy to send any of these to you, Mark, to make these available, this little slide deck. Uh, totally happy to do that too. That sounds so, great. Okay, go. Um, so the reason why this question was such a great one, Mark, and, and what we're looking at right there for those who are viewing and those who are not, basically I'm looking at force improvements because again, we know that our the, the product increases club head speed and there's a lot of products that help golfers increase club head speed. Um, but what we wanted to do was look at some really practical ways it was increasing speed and see comparisons and see if we could fine tune the training to make it better. So um, on the left is a, the first study I did, which was our level one protocol, uh, right-handed golfers, and they did both dominant and the non-dominant swing. So like you just described, you know, Mr. Player would suggest, take some right-hand swings, take some left-hand swings. It's important for you to do both. It's something we're really passionate about. Mm -hmm. And basically what we see is, you know, there are three forces that are pretty important to the golf swing. All right. All of these forces are on the lead leg, at least tip. Those are the ones that are the highest correlated to club head speed. Okay. So this is lead leg force during the downswing. And I think the simplest way to think about this, Mark, because again, this is where we can get lost in the details of ground reaction force curves and numbers. The key is amateur golfers need to send more force to the lead leg and they need to send it there earlier in the downswing. Yeah, I, that I think that's the easiest way to think about it. And then, and they've, that, also, then they've also got to understand that there's a slow you, you it goes there early and then slows down because yes, a lot of folks just keep going and then just keep going exactly. Yeah. And that's where this sequence of these forces. So we've got the force that goes up and down. That's an important force in the golf swing. Right. We have the force that goes uh, away from the target. That's an important one. That's the one that you just described where. At some point, I've got to generate some force away from my target. Otherwise, my body just falls over and I don't have the ability to create that nice rotation at the end of my swing. And the slingshot of energy to the club head. Exactly. That's a key, key component right there. Um, and then the third one is this kind of behind my golfer, right? Headed towards my back. And that's the one that you just described. That's kind of this slingshotting rotational effect. Right. And we need all of those forces to increase and have good timings otherwise you know like you said the force is going nowhere it's doing nothing mm -hmm. so in this in this first study i did you see 11 to 13 percent increases in these really important forces i see a, a five mile per hour increase in club head speed and we just talked about what three to four miles per hour will do so is five miles per hour significant yes. yeah go out and imagine you just hit your driver 15 yards further and you're hitting all your irons seven to ten yards further Mm -hmm. um it's a huge deal right yeah no kidding no, and, 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 I, and i will say this yeah. too because sometimes i think um like when i do launch monitor training with my folks with a flight scope and i say well you'll swing six degrees down and we need to move that to zero and that, this this sounds like the biggest thing in the world but it's actually it's a very fine number because a degree oh, yeah. is small um if a person wants to really understand the difference in speed I'm, I'm teaching my 15 year old daughter to drive the difference between 25 miles an hour in a car and 30 to her right now feels like she's flying. Right. <laughs> and, and that's what it is. You know, I think sometimes we, we, we just gloss over these numbers a bit too much because five miles an hour is a big, big deal. It's a huge deal, right? It's a huge deal for, for these golfers in this distance. And so that was a cool first study. We saw the club head speeds we wanted, uh, the forces going up that, that we know are associated with, with good efficiency in the swing and good transfer of energy. Um, again, these numbers, if you look at percentages, I think that tells a better story, but I think a way to really think about that is in getting, you know, again, let's say your income went up by 13%. Goodness. You know, let's say your weight went down by 13%. Let's say you're, you know, uh, if, I mean, if I told one of my basketball strength and conditioning coaches, that I could have their athlete increasing force by 13% in the, in the exact direction they want it to be, that, golf, that, that strength and conditioning coach would do exactly what I told them. Yeah, of course they would. No, no questions asked. So I find, I find these numbers fascinating, and this is for the folks not watching this. Go and watch it because it's worthwhile looking. I want you to address these because there's dominant and non-dominant training. Uh -huh. and yep. Non-dominant only. And as far as I can see here, there's pretty much increases in uh, across every force vector yes undominant only yeah and that that was this second study i did because there's so there's a lot of debate out there and there's a lot of theoretical debate on this mark right there's a lot of 
well, I'm going to build this equation and, and let's look at this. And if I run it through this model, and honestly, that's a great way to do biomechanics. I'm not saying it's not a wonderful way to look at data, but my model has always been bring a human into my lab, measure them, have them do the testing and, and see what happens to that human. Um, yeah. And then tell that story because that's who we're working with out on the golf course. And so the second study I did was one where I brought in a group of right-handed golfers. I put them through the super speed training protocols, but they only took left-handed swings. That's it. <laughs> so, you know what? I need to call Mr. Player and show, I need to send him to see. He can see it. <laughs> this is, I mean, this is one of those things where they come in. And so I taught them the drill positions. They're doing the left-handed swings. And I mean, they're kind of looking at me like, uh, so I'm, I'm never going to take a right-handed swing with these. I said, no. And they're like, okay, so we're going to measure my gains on my left-handed swings. I'm like, no, no, no. We're going to measure your gains on your right-handed driver swings. That's what we're going to do. And they, again, they're a little bit curious. I tried to at least explain some of the theory, not too much, but enough that they didn't think I was crazy. And they, they bought in, uh, you know, kudos to them for buying in and doing it. So they did this for six weeks. I brought them back in. And again, I'm looking pre post right-handed driver swings, yeah. you know, not left-handed swings. And um, you can see this group, they increased their club head speed by six and a half, mile. and a half miles per hour, <laughs> which is huge. And I think, Mark, you, you mentioned something which, um, uh, and I don't know how much you look at ground reaction force, but you must look at it enough to understand what you just said, which was the ability of the golfer to make sure they don't just keep moving the force forward so that they can create a slingshotting effect of that club, transfer that energy through. Well, well I, yeah, here's the, here's the honest truth about me. I, I've got a, a, a body track mat that I use okay. infrequently, okay? I, I work with flat scope. I, I use that data often. Um, and the thing about me, kind of, I learned everything I know about golf by playing cricket as a kid. That's why from when I started teaching golf, I was more concerned with where the face was aligned and where the path of the bat or golf club was going towards. Mm -hmm. Same thing with tennis. You know, the angle of the bat has a bigger influence than the path of the bat bracket. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I understood quickly enough by just watching speed and, and you talked about angular velocity or momentum, you know how, and I asked you this question early in the conversation. I'm seeing folks, yeah, they got more force in the ground for human sex and pushing away from it, but it's not turning into the, the force transmitted to the club head and the ball. Mm -hmm. So I'm always looking for what ends up in the club head. And to me, the club head's king because that connect, that messages the ball. What I do is, is a secondary actor, even though I have a huge influence on stuff. Yeah, for sure. And, and I think I think what was cool to me about this non-dominant training study and again a little surprising i expected people would gain speed they're swinging clubs fast um and and we knew this was a part of our system that had worked well if you look at that um uh, away from the target force in the non-dominant only group everything looks pretty similar between the two groups except for this one variable where all of a sudden this one variable in the non-dominant only group goes up by 33 percent and that's huge right i mean this is a huge increase yeah. And it's the force that's pointed away from the target. So uh, you had mentioned some of the, the things that I've uh, been able to do down at TPI and some of the trainings I've done with them, right? They have so much great data on golfers, on force plates. And, and when I was down here talking uh, about this, this was the variable that really stood out to them where it was like, this is kind of aha moment for all of us there where we thought, of course, the, in a non-dominant swing, our lead leg acts like a trail leg. And when we get that lead leg to act like a trail leg, there are some things that start happening in this towards the target and, and away from the target plane of motion that can be very beneficial that then transfer over. And I think that's the piece that maybe allows these golfers to almost, like I hate to stabilize on the leg, but I think that's an okay way to think about it. almost stabilize that lead leg after they put force in it so that they can get that nice rotation and transfer all that energy out to the club. Well, well, just to sort of, you know, I guess, uh, clear this up for the golfers listening. If you're a golfer who essentially might struggle with some early extension in the downswing, your lead knee, your golf instructor is always complaining that it's buckled for too long, or you're losing balance and your, low, your legs shoot out from underneath you and you're all arched backwards in your follow through. This stuff is, this is for you. Yeah. 
This is it. And, and you mentioned a, another one that I think in terms of how do we transfer things out to the club head? Mm -hmm. And I, this is probably, and this is a graph I see on, on multiple individuals. This was just one that I took out. All right. um, and I think this tells a really cool story of, of this ability to get this energy out to the club head. Because again, the, at the end of the day, how much of my force and energy and momentum can I transfer out to the club versus how much is lost in translation? Gotcha. Um, and so this was really kind of a neat one. This was a, a player that I worked with. Do, do, and, you, do you describe the, the, the track of the graph too for, for the audio listener? Yep, too, because we're for sure. Yep. So on the vertical axis, I have force just as a percentage of a person's body weight. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the horizontal axis, I have backswing and downswing. And I'm, I'm just depicting the lead leg force right now in the vertical direction. Right. And so it starts out at about you know 50% of, of the, the body weight. And during the backswing, uh, this was a golfer. What we'd like to see is that force to go down a little bit is maybe signifying right, a little bit more load. Forward leg, yeah. You got it, right? Yeah. And so we see that, right? We see the force come down and that's nice. It comes down in a similar fashion, both pre and post. But then some things happen that are very different in the red curve. This is his pre six weeks of super speed training. Looks like the and acceleration is slower and taking longer, right? For sure. And this is, this is that piece I talked about, which is kind of how quickly do we produce force? Mm -hmm. The slopes of those line, that red one is so flat. And the blue one is really Vertical, steep, yeah, exactly. really steep. And what's cool about that is then two things happen, right? First off, you can see that that blue gets much higher than the red. It's peaking at about 130% of body weight. Uh -huh. So let's say you're a 200 pound individual because I like easy math. And we say this is 130% of your body weight. Uh, so that just means that you just went to 260 pounds of force on your lead leg. Um, so a lot more force on the red one, it peaked out at about 90%. Uh, percent. So maybe only 180 pounds of force. So 80 more pounds of force in it. If you think that's significant or not, go pick up something that weighs 80 pounds. Well, well, and, and, and just so folks can get this too. All right. You, you, you'll, you'll hear the, the social media, Twitter, uh, Twitter Rati, if you will, and they talk about you push on the ground and the ground's going to push you right back. Um, this is essentially because the, G, the GRF, the ground reaction forces, is you push down into that lead leg and you put as much force on the ground as possible. And that allows you to straighten up, to open up, to yep. sling that club it around yep. you. Yep. And that's and essentially I, what's happening here. Yeah. And that's a great point, Mark, because I think what people misunderstand about the ground reaction force is if I were to say a ground reaction force that's pointed upward, people are going to automatically think, well, which way is the golfer moving? Well, the golfer's got to be moving upward. Yeah, exactly. And that's not exactly how ground reaction force works. Ground reaction force is directly tied to acceleration. Mm -hmm. And so what you've just described is our really very best players are, are players that tend to offload a little bit early in the downswing. Okay. meaning we see that force drop a little bit below body weight. And then what happens is from that stationary position at the top of their swing, you see them almost kind of that mini squat. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, in order to stop a mini squat, what do I need to do? Well, I need to generate a lot of upward force. Yeah, exactly. Thank so you. it's not that these people all of a sudden like have to jump off the ground. And this is what you described like, Oh, lots of ground reaction force. I better jump during my swing. Well, if you're going to do that, it better be because you've offloaded at the right time. Exactly. And then you've generated so much ground reaction forces at a good time that you've been able to transfer that out to the club. It's not just about, hey, in my swing, I'm just going to go ahead and, and jump right out. And, and this is one mark where I, what the other thing I love about these curves is look at how much earlier this force is peaking yes. uh, post training. So the yellow line is club impact. The green line is about 83% of the downswing. So maybe about club vertical on the downswing. Mm -hmm. You would much rather have your force, your force peaking at club vertical because now you have enough the, the time to transfer it out to the club head. Yeah. Uh, whereas this golfer pre, they were peaking right at impact. They Again, they've lost their ability to, to use that energy. I, 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 I want to describe this because you know me, I'm all about the understanding for the listener. And this, this information you're sharing is awesome. And I've kept you for long, so I want us to put a bow on this. Uh -huh. I'm going to draw an image and then I want you to build on this. 
Yeah. When I'm giving golf lessons, I often describe it to a golfer who's struggling with the idea of getting the club to accelerate and turn the corner at the correct time because mm -hmm. we swing on arcs, right? We don't swing in a straight line. And so the image I draw, I'm like, I want you to imagine that you are on water skis and there's a boat in front of you and the boat puts the force down, it accelerates and it pops you out of the water. Then it starts going. And now when you swing out to the side, then you start to pull wider and you feel yourself going faster. And then when the boat turns in a corner, it's going to sling you off there like it does the ski jumper. And then they're like, oh my goodness. So then I say to them, okay, now consider that your body is the boat and the club head is the skier. And you see folks starting to use the ground earlier in the downswing and then sort of get out of the way. I guess that's a bad yes. description of it, but, but, but there's not a long lateral. There's, there's not a lot of body movement. The movement is staccato, it's fast, and it's centralized very much too. Yeah, I almost think of, I love that description, Mark, because I, what I envision is when a lot of golfers try and swing fast, I think their initial thought is throw the hands down, right? Just yeah. kind of cast things down, move the skier, you could say, right? Just bring the skier closer to the boat and, and hope that things work out. And now we're a litmus of problems, right? We're, we're early casting, we've lost all that speed, all, all those issues, right? Um, as opposed to thinking about it like, well, if I could just manipulate that boat, use my body to kind of almost pull myself back, put myself in a good position. And then naturally what's going to happen is that club's going to act like that skier because I've put my body in the correct position using that force that now I get that beautiful slingshotting effect mm -hmm. um, of the club head out at, at that impact. And I think that's what's really been neat to me, Mark, is that, you know, to me, it's all about finding the right tool to help the golfer make that improvement. And I think for some golfers, it, it's uh, something, a visual you might describe to them. That's how they learn. For some golfers, uh, they might um, try this drill over and over again. What was really neat to me about this was if I use our super speed clubs as a tool in the toolkit, what's coming out of it is these improvements in the way I want them to move. And now as a golf instructor, I don't have to worry about teaching some of this stuff. I can spend my time focusing on other things because I know this stuff is going to line up the right way as a result of utilizing this tool. Well, I'm glad you say that because I, I'm a firm believer in two things. And when I started teaching, this came to me, maybe it was divine inspiration where I was like, there are two important connections, your connection with a club. So your hands and the force you put on the club to control where it's pointing mm -hmm. and then your connection to the ground. It's kind of like your foundation. And that's important for stability, but also you can, you know, derive energy. Any athletic endeavor moves from there. So then building on that, and I'll let you take it from here. I'm like sequencing is a huge deal and just proper application of club face to golf ball is a massive deal. And the sequencing, and you touched on this, has a big effect on the ability to present that club face to the ball or to the arc, I should say, to be really correct, a little more consistently. Yeah, and I think that's where, and I, again, because I am obsessed with the game of golf, Mark, uh, this is something that I've, I've read a lot about, I've, I've done a lot of work with now in my lab, and I think trying to help these golfers understand what the root cause of the error is, and I just think what we see more and more, and I think what we know now more and more because of these, these ground reaction force uh, data collections and what we can see from really good players and not so good players um, is that yes, the hands are, are that last uh, uh, attachment point to the club. So there's a lot going on there that's important, but you're manipulating a lot of that stuff by the way that you utilize the ground and then pass energy through the legs up through the pelvis trunk torso out that way. And so this is again, one of those things where, you know, it doesn't cure every problem. I'm, I'm not sitting here saying, Hey, you know, swing this green super speed club and uh, everything's going to be great. But as a, as a tool, man, not only is it improving that kinetic sequencing, but guess what? If you start moving force more forward in your backswing or, or sorry, more forward in your downswing earlier, there's a really good chance that those hands in the club are going to fall into a better position. Yeah. Um, and now if I can get a great instructor to help you manipulate and line up that club face to the path, mm -hmm. wonderful. Right now, now we've got a really great scenario. All right. Uh, great scenarios. I wish we had more time. I've kept you for too long. <laughs> um, just to, two closing questions and I'll allow you to follow up. First off, 
if the view, viewers slash listeners just wanted to see a really good model watching television of someone that does this well, I want you to think of that off the top of your head and then just put a bow on the conversation, please. Yeah, I mean, to me, the one when, I, when we think about offloading and loading and, and good downswing, um, I like I see it in Rory so well. Oh, I was, I was um, thinking the same. I was thinking the same. Yeah, way. I know that's that's the low hanging fruit, but it's like, why wouldn't we pick the person who does this the very best? Watch his swing in slow motion, and notice this offloading effect where where you see after the top of his swing, you see a little drop down. He's a person that you can start seeing force go forward to that lead leg almost before he ever finishes a downswing and then you just get this beautiful transfer of force through and i mean there's just it's a thing of beauty um is it as simple okay i'll i'll lead you to the final question forget it. <laughs> it's my podcast i can yeah do whatever you want so, so is this as simple as folks going to super speed golf i think it is dot com getting the sticks going through the protocols and doing their thing and being disciplined about it. Cause I have the sticks. Yeah. I swing them once in a while. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And I, and I think, um, again, I have just seen so many awesome things in my lab, Mark, again, not with, like we've said, I think the theme of this, which I like this being the theme, it's some practical stuff that I'm trying to do in my lab to see how this is working and help golfers understand if it can be something that can benefit their game. And I think when I see golfers go through the level one protocol, the way it's outlined to watch ground reaction force improve, to see club head speed go up, to see ball speeds go up. Um, and then it, really, this is that key component, which I think maybe trumps everything, Mark, is these golfers come in and they're, they're loving golf more than they ever have before. Love it. Um, so, yeah, I think it's as simple as that. I oh, mean, I'm so glad you reached out to us. This is fantastic stuff, folks. Go, uh, if you're listening, go to my YouTube account or go to markimmelman.com, check it out. Uh, folks, if they want to find you, I'm sure they do, Tyler. Uh, where can they go? Social media, website, that sort of stuff. Yeah, so I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram, uh, Tyler Standiford or T Standy. Um, and again, um, just, you know, kind of reach out to me, connect there. And, and this is something that I, I love talking about this stuff. I I love communicating. In fact, I just was interacting with one of our super speed users. He just, he just bought the set. Our CEO sent me the information. He had a question he thought I could answer. And now him and I email back and forth. He'll ask me questions and it's just, it's fun, right? It's fun helping golfers gain more speed and love the game more. So find me and reach out. Appreciate everything you're doing. Stay in that lab. Keep, uh, keep sharing the gold, man. I appreciate you. Yeah, we'll do Mark. Thanks for the chat.